So that's one example of what our money does when we take a collection for one grade out of sharing, which we'll take at any time, but especially next week is when we're emphasizing it. We'll find envelopes that you can put your information in if you'd like. So we're beginning um, to, in the second half of our series, this is the fourth out of six. We're studying Adam Hamilton's book, The Creed, and we're looking at a series of what is it that you believe when you say, I believe this about my faith. And it's the fifth Sunday of Lent, so we're getting closer to the goal of our preparation, which is a celebration of Easter Sunday and the victory over death that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. So we're studying now the last part of the Apostles' Creed. We were uh, into the, I believe, the Holy Spirit, and, and we're looking at these two lines right now. And the one line that says, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. And the very next line continues, and the communion of saints. So in order to start us off, I was thinking, what verse, um, there are many to look at in terms of what does church mean to you. And one of the earliest verses that we can find a depiction or a description of church is when Jesus says something to Peter, or to all the disciples. And it's kind of an early expression of church. And you have those scripture passages, I think they're on the front of your bulletin, and a a few notes on the back, if I'll be referring to these, or you'll see some of these, and something you take to your small group, or learn and look more on your own. So here's Matthew 5 and verse 14, where Jesus is speaking the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. And down to 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And so we know that you is plural, so he's talking about the disciples, but he's also talking about us, those who have gathered in his name about you and I are the light of the world. So we're looking at church, and I was with some friends yesterday. We have a Saturday morning biking group, so I have about 15 guys around me, all men. They're all kind of uh, middle-aged which means younger than I am. And they, um, some of them go to church. They have a bunch of them are, uh, uh, I think, non-church doors. And so I said, what does church mean? To you? And, and what do you think most of them said? It's a building, right? It's a building. The church is a building. And then they talked about different things. And, and it's interesting to think, what do people outside these walls think when they think about church? And what do you think? How would you describe church when someone asks you, what is it that you believe when you say, I believe in church? So that's, that's the back burner today, right? That's what you're thinking about. I, want, I hope that you'll leave with something percolating in your mind to answer that question. So that if, if we can look at these different passages in the Apostles' Creed, we can see that they even help us out a little bit because they give us two adjectives to, to help describe, at least begin a description of what you think about church. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. So sometimes we say the Apostles' Creed in this service, sometimes we sing it, but these are the more common words that we say and so if you're really serious about your faith, I have to ask you, what does that mean to you, or are you just saying rote memory? So let's look at these words right now, okay? So I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Holy, well, it's certainly not meaning really righteous people who are nearly perfect. Just look around you. Or look right here in the pulpit, right? Um, biblical meaning is right here. It's belonging to God, sacred to God. Set apart for God. That's what holy means. Something can be holy, or someone can be holy. But that's what it really means. In the Old Testament, the temple is holy. Why is it holy? Because it was set apart for the worship of God. The people of the covenant were said to be holy. Why? 
because they sensed a special calling to fulfill God's purpose. In the New Testament, the word holy refers to more ordinary people. We talked about that with the Holy Spirit. The more ordinary people who have been called out by God's grace to bear witness to God's great act of love and grace in Jesus Christ. So, if we say that, uh, um, if you want to look at a modern definition of church as, as not being a country club for perfect people, but as being a hospital for broken people who are sick, who are slowly getting well, then the church becomes holy when those who are part of her recognize that she belongs to God and not to her people. The church is holy when those who consider the church home don't ask, what can this church do for me? But instead they ask, what does God want his church to do for him? And that's why I can say, I believe in the holy church. Because that's my understanding of holy. So, what is your understanding of holy? So let's go to the other word, which is an interesting word for us in our um, modern world. Catholic. Now, <clears throat> again, I said this is an adjective, the way it's used in the Apostles' Creed. It is not a noun. Some of you grew up in the Catholic Church, and, and we've talked about that. And many times when people see this word, that's all they can think of because that's all that they use. We don't use the word Catholic in our country and in our modern times, meaning what it originally meant, because it has been so overcome with an understanding of a noun, the Roman Catholic Church. The real great irony here is that the, the word Catholic um, is, is meaning, and you get this word from 930, Acts 931, throughout, universal, um, the unity of everyone, uh, bound together by the gospel, it's this, this universal idea. So in the Roman Catholic Church, Roman because the headquarters was in Rome, Catholic because it was the whole known world at the time. Okay? But the irony here is that in 1054, there was the great split, if you study uh, history, the great split between the Roman Catholic Universal Church and what was the Orthodox Church, what we call Eastern Orthodox. There are many versions of that, but let's limit to Eastern Orthodox, not Russian and all those. Eastern Orthodox. Catholic means universal. Ortho means uh, the right way of thinking, the correct way of thinking. So you're saying, okay, we're over here, we're all, world, all around the world, and we're over here, we think correctly. You know, we're, and, and that's the great split in the church. And Presbyterians continued that split 500 years later, because we're part of the Reformation, and we've been splitting ever since. Because we can't understand the definition of church. We all have our own definition of what it means. So Catholic here, if you really want to uh, understand the best definition of Catholic, it's, it's an ecumenical belief that all who call upon the name of Christ and seek to follow Him as Savior and Lord, despite their denomination or their non-denomination, are a part of the Catholic Church. So that the Church at its very best is truly Catholic which means transcending all boundaries of nationality, race, language, culture, political, economical systems. That's what, when we say, I believe in the Catholic Church, that's what it's supposed to mean. So, what do you believe when you say Catholic? Well, let's go to the next word. So it's, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Church, right? Church. That's a word that you and I, again, have a cultural, modern understanding about. The word is ecclesia, and if you look at ecclesiology, that's a study of the church or church history, ecclesiastical, it's all the same thing. 
But look what it means. It means called out as a gathering of people or an assembly. You didn't even have to be religious. You could be in the country club and be a church. You could be in the rotary club and be a church in the understanding of what church meant then. It didn't necessarily mean something to do with faith. So when you're talking about uh, churches being a gathering of people, probably uh, the most common modern understanding of church would be an assembly. An assembly of gathered people. So you could basically have any kind of gathering, and you could have called it a church at that time. The one thing that church is not is what my Viking friend said. A building. It's not a structure. Highland is not a $15 million structure on 12 acres. Highland is you sitting out here in these seats. And all the people that make up the membership, that is the church, not the structure. But of course, we're very building oriented in our culture, and so this is a church. That's what we think. That's why it's so difficult when you say, I believe in the church. What do you believe in? What are you saying when you're saying, I believe in the church? Um, <coughs> Peter said, once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. And so what happens is this word church, it came to me more than just an assembly of a gathering, like a nice rotary club. It had something to do with being a Christian. And and the first time that you see this word in the Gospels is when Jesus speaks to Peter and he says, I tell you, you are Peter. Remember his, other, his name is Cephas, which means rock? You are Peter, the, on this rock I will build what? My church. Not a church, not the church, my church. Very clear that Jesus has taken ownership of this gathering of people. Alright? That's, again, what do you think that it means? Because in Jesus' mind, I believe that when he says his ecclesia, his assembly, he is saying that it's a group of people who are professing their faith in him as the Son of God and the Gospel of, uh, that God provides salvation. So that's one reason why I love the Highland motto, which is people following Jesus. Jesus has to be the equation if it's a church. So what do you believe about church? It is precisely this relationship with Jesus Christ that it actually distinguishes us from a synagogue, country club, rotary club, Anybody else? And the word that describes this relationship best is the very next word that's used in the Apostles Creed, which we know of, and we will celebrate this sacrament, which uses the same word, which is communion. So communion has to do with community. Uh, communion has to do, it says, the communion of the saints. So you're thinking, wait, wait, stop. Communion is this right here, right? It's a sacrament. This is also called the Lord's Supper. It's also called the Last Supper. It's also called the Eucharist or Eucharist meal. Eucharist means thanksgiving, and to be thankful in Greek. It's a meal of thanksgiving. And we call it communion, one of our two sacraments, communion and baptism. So that when we say communion of the saints, I believe in the communion of the saints. What do you believe? You ever thought about it? You wonder what it means? You say that in front of someone? How are you going to explain that to them? Or what it means? So church is, um, this whole idea of communion, church is best described as a communion, a community of faith, a family of faith, some people say. This whole word, koinonia, it's, I got it up here. Uh, yeah, it means communion. We translate it communion. It could mean sharing. It could mean fellowship. That's a very popular translation nowadays, fellowship, for the koinonia. That, that, what's 
that glue that binds us together? What's the common denominator that makes us? Not that we're members of Highland, but what is it? That, that faith in Jesus Christ. We're part of this particular church, but it also binds us around the world as well in terms of a much greater communion of saints, right? This word, koinonia, is used a hundred times when the apostles are talking to the Christians in different churches when they say to the brothers, or we, we say brothers and sisters now, and they talk about the community. Um, in his letter to Galatia, that's kind of the, it's a bunch of churches in central Turkey, Paul uses for the first time a new meta metaphor to describe church about this community because he says, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. So that family of faith, first time it's ever been used in terms of this community of gathering for a single purpose of professing faith in God and such. Now we're getting very personal, right? This communion, what does it mean? The kind, this kind of personal caring that's known as koinonia, fellowship, a whole lot more than just sharing coffee together. We're going to go have fellowship in our things. What does koinonia really mean under that surface, below the surface of coffee? Building meaningful relationships together, caring for one another in times of need, encouraging each other in times of desperate situations, celebrating in times of joy, crying in times of sorrow or loss. Hamilton says this, I quote, this was the purpose of the church, to foster, build, and serve as a community of people, devoted to one another, brotherly and sisterly love, bound together by a common faith, and working together to live out their faith in the world. We are not only Christ's assembly, we are his family. Well, I have seen Koinonia close up and personal in the nearly 40 years of my ministry. I've known the good, and I've known the bad. Anybody can pick out something bad to complain about when you get an assembly as big as we are right now. That's why I said we don't have a suggestion box today. <laughs> and I know many a person in church who hasn't always lived up to their calling, which is, I think, just about everyone in this room. But I have also known and experienced the deepest and most blessing, most blessed definition of fellowship. There are many opportunities that I've seen this take place in my life. The one I think about that I shared in the other group was I became a grandfather at 49 years old. Not expected, not wanted, not planned, not any script that any of you would write. It. And I found out the day before our grandson was born. Didn't even know about the pregnancy. Didn't even, had never met the mother. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm a, I'm a minister in the community. What are people going to think about all this? And, and I really um, lost a whole lot of sleep about this. I remember taking a day off and, and uh, playing golf by myself one time just to get away. And at one time, it hit me so hard, I couldn't see the greens through the tears. In that church, when I finally went to the session and told them, I mean, church at its best, there is nothing better. There's nothing better. Where, who are you going to call at 2 a.m. in the morning when things go around? Am I going to call my brother nine hours away or the one 18 hours away? Who am I going to call? Who are you going to call? I'll bet there's a good chance you'll call someone sitting in this sanctuary right here. This is the coin of me of the fellowship, the communion of the saints in every church I've served, I've seen that. 
As Hamilton says, no one perfectly lives out the values and faith they have espoused. But when church is striving to be church, she is one of the most beautiful communities in all the world. A community that seeks to selflessly encourage and bless others. A community where you can be accepted no matter who you are. When the church is at its best, there you will find family who will welcome you and stand beside you. This is how Peter describes the, the body of Christ, as he calls it. You are a chosen race. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. What a wonderful definition of church at its very best. These are the people who are willing to take risks love others. Push back that darkness of poverty, suffering, injustice, and through all the good things that you do, shine the light of God's love and compassion and grace and mercy. And in that way, the world sees the testimony that you provide, the truth and the power of church espousing the Christian gospel of Jesus Christ. The communion of saints is used 235 times in the New Testament. What do you believe when we say, I believe? It's a term referring to all Christians who are being transformed, becoming what new, the New Testament calls sanctified, but I love what Hamilton says, to become sanctified. This is what Paul is talking about in the scripture that's on your bulletin in um, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed in His image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So as you once again come to this communion table, Think of what communion is in your definition, in your belief system. Certainly to commune, sharing together with your Lord, but also in the koinonia, the fellowship and communion of this fellowship in this room, which we call the communion of the saints. Think about the 12 disciples around the table to the 2.2 billion current Christians in the world communing around the table. Those are ordinary people, just like you and me. Ordinary people who yielded their lives to God and through whom God worked in remarkable ways because these people were willing to define themselves by how much they loved God and others. Hamilton uses a great phrase here I've not heard before. Ordinary saints. Sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? But then I started thinking, what's it take? My ending question to you, what's it take to be an ordinary saint. To daily seek to love other others as your neighbor. To speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves. To show kindness and compassion for those who are hurting. To offer your greatest commodity. And that's not your checkbook. It's your time to those who need your presence, particularly in ways that you will never be publicly celebrated. That's an ordinary saying. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, 
because I see its evidence right here at Highland. And I believe in the communion of the saints because there are plenty of wonderful examples sitting right here in this room. So what do you believe?